All right, and we are live. What is going on, Buffs Nation? Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. If you're watching the live or catching the replay, be sure to hit that like. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Uh, today, joined by my friend Adam Munster Tiger from 24 uh, 7 Sports and Buff Stampede. Adam, how are you doing today? David, I'm doing excellent. Yeah, we collaborated on a live a few weeks back and, and had fun with that. So decided let's do a mailbag. And as we're gearing up for spring ball, uh, it kind of makes you start really looking at some of the different topics and, and position groups and, uh, and predicting uh, how this thing is going to shake out once they get into those 15 practices. And um, obviously it's going to be a, a fluid deal with a lot of positions that even some of them won't get, you know, the, the edge group won't get BJ green till the summer. The receivers don't get Will Shepard till the summer, but th there's just so much to talk about with CU football these days. Oh yeah, absolutely. love it. It is phenomenal being a fan of this team because there literally is something every day to talk about and really love the idea that we're doing this mailbag for those who are watching in the live we have a few different questions that adam has picked from uh, the 24 7 message board over at buff stampede so we'll roll through those first and then if there are any other questions um anybody that's official members of the channel uh part of the fellas feel free to like Bodie feel free to send in questions or anybody that wants to ensure that that we see some feel free to send a super chat but we'll try and get through as many questions as we can here in the next 30 to 40 minutes uh this should be a, a lot of fun so let's go ahead and uh and, and get started so this one comes from all buff no fluff what if anything will keep the buffs in the bowl friend zone i.e another in infamous five and seven yeah that's a good one to lead off right we're not we're not easing into this it's right into uh you know records and in what can keep them out of yeah five there's been too many five and seven seasons at cu uh and uh too many times david that i've been at home during the holidays as opposed to being on the road covering a bowl game and, and i'm not making plans this year because I think Colorado goes to a bowl game. Now, what would keep that from happening? You can call me a homer, but based on the amount of talent that's coming into this program right now, mm -hmm. I really feel like if Shadur Sanders is healthy, they're going to a bowl game this year. Now, you know, if the O-line doesn't gel as, as well as, as we expect it to based on just kind of, you know, their their actions upon their arrival in Boulder and really uh, kind of having the mindset that, that you needed out of that group, even if, if they're not as good as maybe we think they're going to be right now, it's still a bowl team to me. Even if they get injuries at some other positions, I think you've got enough, enough depth at most spots, and, and certainly you've got to address linebacker now, but you've got, you can handle a guy going down at different positions, but a quarterback, you don't have another Shadur Sanders, so, you know, th that's... A simple answer, David, but as long as he's healthy and, and plays in the majority of the games this fall, I, I just I, I don't under I, I couldn't see Colorado not finding a way to win at least six. And, and you look at the Big Twelve, and there's going to be parity, and it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be mm -hmm. tough week to week, but it, it's not a juggernaut. And you're gonna if you come out the gate strong, be going to be favored in in the majority of games, I would think. Uh, but you know, certain things have to come together. We'll talk about that as we get through spring ball, but. This is a bowl team in 2024. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that. I think my first uh, idea, like you just touched on, just goes to injuries. If we're banged up, especially at key positions, that's what could keep us from, from reaching that bowl game. I think uh, my first year that I was at school here at CU was 2018. So it was that last year of uh, Mike McIntyre where we got off to that awesome five and oh start and then finished on that that seven game losing streak and uh, similar to what we've kind of seen uh, last year a, a little bit and i don't necessarily feel as concerned uh, about this as maybe we might have been in years past but if we start out really hot and we fail to make those adjustments that defenses and offenses of opposing teams uh, make after having a handful of weeks of game film, I think that could be something that that might 
hinder us if we fail to make adjustments as we go throughout the the year, adding new wrinkles to the offense and defense, giving them new looks. But I think with the guys that we got that we've uh, hired slash retained, Pat Shermer and now Robert Livingston, uh, I, I, I feel confident in terms of their competencies uh, with, with dealing with, with new looks and uh, game planning adjustments. Yeah. It's funny you brought up 2018 because they were as close to bowl eligible as you can get without getting it. Uh, yeah. they, they were, if memory serves, Colorado was five and two, up 28 nothing at halftime against Oregon State. And Brian Howell and I in the press box that day were talking in terms of it's not a question of which, it's not a question of if we're going to cover a bowl game, it's which one. And Brian Howell happened to run into the Sun Bowl execs who were out at that Oregon State game before the Beavers come back. And they were talking like, Colorado's not going to fall to us because they're too good. Uh, but they wanted Colorado because Steven Montez is from El Paso. And so it would have been a, a great story. So, uh, you know, and then we don't need to talk about the rest of that season. But I kind of learned in that moment, maybe don't talk about bowl games until they're eligible. So that just shows you. <laughs> The, the confidence level that I have in this 2024 group from an overall talent standpoint, I just, um, if, if number two is, is healthy, uh, they're, they're going to find a way to, to get above that, that five and seven record. I think so too. I think so too. All right. This is another great question coming in from Nelly Buff, 2424. How well do you think our NLI money is coming together versus other teams in the top 25? Adam, I know you spoke uh, recently with uh, the guys over from the 5430 Foundation. If y'all haven't checked out that episode of Adam's podcast, please be sure to do it. But yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts right now and where you feel like we stack up, not only in the top 25, I'll adjust this question a little bit, but where we stack up in the Big 12. Yeah, it's, it's great that you brought up the 5430 Foundation because uh, a year ago they weren't really in the ball game as far as an NIL collective goes. Now I know Buffs for Life does great work and it, it, they have a cool platform as well. You can go on there and you can specify, you know, what program or player you want to donate money to. And uh, it's a great cause as well. A lot of their stuff deals with mental health outreach and, and obviously taking care of former Buffs that for whatever reason, you know, uh, you know, life hands a curveball and they need some, some assistance. And so it's a great foundation, but, um, 54 30 is, is dedicated towards the football program. And like you said, I, I talked to those guys and it's a great analogy. They said that, that we've got this, uh, you know, Ferrari that we, that needs gas. You know, we, we've, we got to support what coach prime is building in Boulder and, his charisma, his fame, his ability as a recruiter, and just the excitement that he's brought to Boulder gets them in the discussion for guys where they they can't compete nil wise. But you still, for some for the, for those top guys, you still need to come going to have to come up with something. And uh, you know, credit to them, they've been really creative in terms of you know Jordan Seaton is out at the Super Bowl doing radio interviews. How many he should be in high school right now? He was an early enrollee, so. To have that opportunity, that that's something that Coach Prime in Colorado gives uh, guys that, that come to play for Boulder, uh, you know, especially the, the high profile guys. Um, but David, I, I mean, I could probably list off twenty five programs right now that have a stronger NIL collective than Colorado, just in terms of the actual money. And, and you know, part of that speculation, um, and part of that is covering recruiting and, and hearing things and, and seeing. Um, you know, an offensive lineman come out to Boulder last year and fall in love. And when it comes to and this, is not Jordan Seaton. It's a it's a different highly rated offensive lineman that wanted to be a buff, but CU wasn't going to be in the ball game nil. And so there are guys that they don't have a chance at because of that. But um, they are in a much better spot as far as that goes right now because of fifty four thirty foundation than they would have if we were having this conversation a year ago. So um, it's it's helpful to have Coach Prime, but for some of those kids, they're, they're asking for big money in Colorado. Just it isn't going to be quite on that level for you know the, the bulk of their recruiting class. Yeah, I feel like right now, I feel like the program has kind of had to pick and choose who they're they're going to uh, support in that way, you know. And yeah, it's it's funny because yeah, I don't think necessarily we have the the biggest 
NIL collective backing right now, but I feel like it's definitely improved since Coach Prime has gotten here. You know, I don't think a lot of these blue chip guys that we brought in are, are coming here without uh, some sort of uh, financial support or backing in, in, in some way. But I think we're definitely still punching above our weight right now in terms of our overall recruiting than, you know, kind of where a normal four and eight team. Uh, one and eleven team uh, sh should be over the last couple years, and I, I think a lot of the guys that we've been going after, uh, we whether we've won those uh, recruiting battles at the high school or transfer portal level, uh, like we've been battling with guys that or with teams that are in the top ten, within the top fifteen of recruiting uh, normally, and so I, I think hey, if we're able to put together. Uh, winning season this next year, go to a bowl game, compete for a conference championship. I mean, you have to imagine that we're going to start having more and more uh, success with the recruits, and then more of the money will come along uh, as well. Yeah, and, and one thing, I, I guess I should clarify my comments a little bit here, and too, it's, there's a diff big difference between collectives and NIL, and, and this is something that Coach Prime has brought up. If you're, if you're just talking about name, image, and likeness, the way that it was supposed to be set up and, and utilized and, and the way that these student-athletes were supposed to be compensated for, again, their name, image, and likeness, Colorado would be top five, maybe even number one in the country in that regard. When you, you talk about the Coach Prime documentary, uh, all the exposure they give players through YouTube, um, and just being around Coach Prime, and you see Charlie Offered all on an Almonds commercial. I mean, that, that stuff doesn't happen at most college football programs, right. right? So if it was just name, image, and likeness, then, man, they, they'd be cleaning up. But, mm -hmm. but, yeah, there is the collective part of it, which um, – uh, I don't know how that ever changes. You know, it doesn't seem like it's going to anytime soon. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you there. Let's move on to this question from Blue Sky 2. <laughs> More of a comment, but we can take it as a question. Seems like we have, uh, we've had five plus four or five star quarterback recruits come to Boulder, but not one hopeful uh, to sign. Uh, frustrating. Uh, you know, how do you read right now um, what we're doing with the quarterback room? And I, I could also segue this, Adam, to this other question that we have from GoBuffs87 uh, regarding CU's quarterback in the 2025 season. Do you think they're on the current roster or is it going to be, uh, you know, instantly one of these four or five uh, star recruits that we bring in or, or through the transfer portal? What has been your read or assessment right now for how they've attacked the quarterback position at the recruiting uh, level right now? Yeah, it's good to kind of put those questions together because mm -hmm. uh, to the first question there about being frustrated in, in it's 2024, so nobody has patience anymore. I mean, it's just everybody wants to know everything right away. And, right. But it, there are still 10 months until – even a, a Bryce Underwood, who's verbally committed to LSU, um, a Deuce Knight, who's currently verbally committed to Notre Dame. It's still 10 months before they can even make it official to the schools they've, they've verbally committed to. Um, and so that's one part of it that, you know, th th there's going to be movement and, and not necessarily specifically 100% those two guys. I think Underwood's a little bit more solid right now mm -hmm. and whereas you know deuce knight we just heard um him i think it was on three did a story with him about yep. how um he is um building a good relationship with colorado you know colorado was trying to get him out for a visit so uh it's not that uh anything is official with anybody in that class right now and then uh you throw in the transfer potential transfer component we're still what is it 11 months basically away from needing to have that guy on campus and so there is time to figure this out uh, and it is encouraging that if you look at the 24 7 composite quarterback rankings for 2025 the bus have been heavily involved with four of the top six guys so wow just take that in a little bit that you know they're they could get david a, a three-star quarterback to commit tomorrow if they wanted to right this is about trying to get the best possible guy they can in that class julian lewis from georgia also, he's verbally committed somewhere else right now, USC, but he was out at, at Colorado in January, and it sounds like he's going to be back out in Boulder this spring for another visit. Georgia is still in the mix with him as well. So 
Colorado's kind of top three for, you know, one of the top quarterbacks there. And, um, you know, they, they've looked at some other guys. I'm going to totally butcher, totally butcher his name. What's the, the last name of the, the Clemson star quarterback? Oh, you know DJ. No, not. Yeah, not, but, no. yeah, but yeah. Um, Madden EMA Lay Ava is a four star from California that Pat Shermer actually went out, evaluated this spring, and they've offered him. So okay. they've they've got quite a few irons in the fire. I I, I think some of the, the frustration and, and maybe would come in the fact that they kind of f- thought they had this already locked up with Antoine Hill, who was going to yep. reclassify to 2024, and he was going to serve as Shadour's understudy this year. Uh, he decided, I mean, that, that's a huge sacrifice to, to graduate. Yep high school an entire year and a half basically early and so when he decided he didn't want to do that you know Colorado had to readjust and like I said you're seeing them get in the mix with some of these guys um, had there not been that period of time where Antoine Hill was committed to Colorado maybe you would have gone after a deuce night the, the Notre Dame commit a little bit earlier and had that further down the process but generally they've done a good job of getting in the mix with these guys and um yeah, some of them are verbally committed elsewhere, but again, it's a long time um, until they're actually going to be officially with that. And then, you know, I, I, it's easy to forget. I forget this sometimes too, David, is you got three scholarship quarterbacks on the roster right now that have eligibility beyond 2024. Right. And we haven't even run through the first set of spring practices for for two of those guys that that, that are new transfers. And um, so there's a, there's a lot to figure out there. No matter what happens, why not try to go for a top transfer next year? I mean, yeah. so I would think that would be the strategy. Um, and if you don't get a top prep quarterback, then maybe you put all your eggs in a couple quarterback transfers next year or, or an elite one. And I think it's going to be a pretty attractive option if Colorado lives up to, again, our expectations, thinking that they're going to be a bowl team and um, Shador graduating and, and all the skill talent that, that Coach Prime and his staff can bring to Boulder transfers are going to look at, at Colorado as a pretty attractive option. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's it's been great to see us in the conversation of a lot of these top quarterbacks because outside of maybe South Carolina, who I think also had like a five-win season, something like that this past year, most of these quarterbacks are looking at winning programs that win after year after year after year. Maybe things are a little bit more proven. Uh, but I think you will see – this is just how I predict it or I expect it. We have that winning season this year. If we're you know reaching new heights that we haven't reached here in, in so long, I think you'll see one of these guys commit. The fact that we're in the conversation uh, right now with a lot of these other top winning programs, these top 25 teams, I, I think it really does speak to the excitement, the recruiting power – the draw that coach prime and the rest of the staff have here now again i understand it if you're looking at it from these quarterbacks perspectives they probably just want to see a little bit more results and i I think we're going to get that this year Uh, if if i was controlling the team uh, probably how i'd want to do it ideally is to bring in one of these top uh, five-star quarterbacks out of high school next year but then also have somebody whether that's through the transfer portal or if one of our guys, Walter Taylor, Ryan Staub, or uh, Dust- Dustin Wade, are developed to where we feel comfortable kind of bridging that gap before we're throwing them out there, before they're, you know, uh, before they're ready, that's how I would like to see it done. Um, I, I think that it's, it's best to not put too much pressure on on true freshmen no matter how good they are um i I know that there are some five star plus guys uh i I think we're all kind of expecting jordan seaton to if if he doesn't start week one start the majority of the year next year and but we've seen guys uh for, for instance this past year at ucla with man why am i forgetting his name now five star plus quarterback uh from michigan uh, transferred to Oregon now. What What is his name again? I'm trying to remember. Maybe somebody in the comments can help me. Um, but yeah, I, you saw him come into UCLA this past year and um, kind of 
I, I, I don't know. Like it didn't go ideally for him. He was he was starting, and then he was benched, and then he was starting again, and he was kind of part of this three man rotation with the UCLA quarterback room. And I don't know if that's necessarily best for for um, so you know. Uh, someone's development. So I, I would like to see us continue to bring in more talent. Um, I love this pro style type of uh, like attitude Corey Phillips, Coach Prime have with talent acquisition that we're always going to be looking for somebody to do the job better. And yeah, we can't hold back at all when it comes to the quarterback position. Um, yeah, m- most definitely. Adam, do you remember that guy's name from uh, UCLA? Why am I? Da- Dante, Dante Moore. Thank you. Dante Moore. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Dante Moore. I don't want a situation like that to happen. And hopefully our, uh, our, our quarterback room next year or in 2025 is in a position to where we can be a little bit more methodical than what we saw uh, with, with him and Chip Kelly this past year. Um, any other thoughts on that? Well, it's funny as we're having this conversation and later today, I'm going to be doing my way too early pre-spring ball depth chart predictions. Mm-hmm. And you start with quarterback and it's like beyond Shadur, I don't know how to rank Ryan Staub and the other, the, the new quarterbacks at this point, uh, yeah. Taylor and Wade. So uh, there's not going to be a whole lot separating those guys. I wouldn't think going into, into spring ball. So you, you play the the averages. You're thinking one or two of those guys is going to be, a, you know, at least at least a quality backup quarterback going forward. And we'll see if one emerges as an actual candidate to start in Boulder. You know, Ryan Staub showed a few things out in Utah. I mean, for for a young man to get thrust into that role late during your true freshman season, I thought he handled that pretty well in a, a tough environment at Utah. Yeah, definitely, and I think he showed. Uh, he showed good arm strength. I think he should have had a touchdown there at the end of the first half. His, his stats probably should should have looked a little bit better. But yeah, I think that he showed that uh, like he's he's capable and that he definitely belongs uh, in this conversation. And he definitely belongs in this room right now. And I think too, particularly with Ryan Staub, I know it wasn't Pat Shermer's playbook last year, but he at least has a little bit of a of an advantage having worked with Pat Shermer for at least a few months longer than, than some of the other guys coming in here this, uh, this semester. And yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how spring practice and, you know, all, all this stuff kind of uh, like turns out, but uh, I, we had one more question here, Adam, from uh, regarding the quarterback room from your message board. This is from CD Tang 55 he says, Adam, would love to see you guys talking about how young quarterbacks head off to Alabama, Ohio State, Texas, Tennessee, maybe Nebraska, when there's already a young stud quarterback ahead of them with three to four years to play. Why would they uh, head for a second or third string quarterback spot initially on the bench when they're five-star rated? Excuse my typo there. What are your thoughts on, on that and, and why quarterbacks end up going to a, a stacked room, so to speak, at some of these other programs? Yeah, it's pretty simple. One, NIL. Uh, you know, those pro- are the programs that offer more to high school blue chip quarterback recruits. Number two is if you're a talented quarterback, you want to go play with talented players and you want to win. You want to go compete for championships. And so those are the programs that, you know, uh, are most attractive. And then lastly, if you're a stud quarterback, you didn't you didn't get to that point by by not having extreme self confidence, right? You've you believe in yourself, you believe you're the man, and uh, for most of those guys around their high school, they're told they're the man all the time, and so they look at you know an opportunity and go, well, I'll, I'll beat out other guys because I have that you know that faith in myself, and then you know maybe lastly, kind of throw in there is that you know because of the portal now, if it does. You get that good NIL money and it doesn't work out, you can go transfer somewhere else. So it's not like you're going to be stuck at that that program if you can't compete you know, for that starting quarterback job early in your career. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, the, the transfer portal allows you to move on to a new situation uh, very quickly, just like we saw with Dante Moore. He's already uh, you know, back with Oregon, which you, I think, was initially committed to. Um, before he flipped on on signing day for for UCLA this past year, and I, I think that for some of the guys though, uh, 
for some of these top guys, I I don't necessarily think that they think they need to start initially or like all four years right off the bat. Um, you know, I've been following being a Broncos fan. I've been following what's going on with with Arch Manning uh, down in Austin with the Texas Longhorns, and his approach might be a little bit different uh, than than other top recruited quarterbacks but he grew up a lifelong Longhorns fan he wanted to play for Texas and you hear him talk about what he thinks is the ideal way uh, to develop in college he said it's it's definitely being able to sit for a, a year or two he said he, he said speaking to his uncle Eli it was really hard uh, being thrust out there at, at Ole Miss so early on and he thinks it's uh, ideal to be in a system for a little while, learn behind the starter, and, and then be ready. I know that some people were speculating how he might transfer with uh, Quinn Ewers coming back for his senior year. But uh, it, it's clear that th he wants to be at the University of Texas. He wants to be developed in that way. And, uh, you know, having uh, instant playing time isn't always – uh, the the key factor in deciding where where he wants to to make his roots and so I think you might see that with some some other quarterbacks as well maybe not initially or or always the the top one or two quarterbacks in every high school class coming out but I, I think some guys really do appreciate the process and, and they want to be at these uh, these blue blood schools that have a proven track record of putting quarterbacks in the NFL definitely. One last question we have from Buff Stampede. Let's talk about Carter Stoutmeyer, his move to safety. Uh, what did you think about this, Adam? Was this something that was on your mind? Were you, uh, were you surprised? Was this something you expected? How do you feel like this improves the, the safety room? It's interesting because when he was a high school recruit flipping from Arizona to Colorado late in the process, and I did – a story talking about his background. His father, Omar Stoutmeyer, played in the NFL as a safety for 11 years, played with Coach Prime with the Cowboys for a couple of years. And he's a he's a, a pretty big DB, Carter, Carter is. And so I was kind of almost thrown off initially that he wasn't already a safety. But he, he's also, he's got, you know, top end speed that had him at competing in the 100 meter dash and winning a lot of meets in high school. So he, he for whatever reason, uh, Grew up playing cornerback, and, and that's where he looked really good at times as a true freshman. He got mm -hmm. uh, kind of banged up at, at a point last year. Um, but it makes sense. Well, first off, spring is the time for experimentation, right? And yes. there are other guys on the roster where you, you put them in a, a spot for however many practices in the spring. Maybe it's all 15, and then you make a decision going forward. I mean, there's other guys. Adam Hopkins, is he going to stay – at cornerback is Isaiah Harge going to stay at cornerback is Savelle Smalls going to stay at tight end uh is Tyler Brown going to be a center or a guard is Travis Jay going to be a safety or corner there's guys that you can move around to different spots and in, in the spring is, is a time to to put Carter Stoutmeyer at safety and see you know how that transition goes and I think David another key piece in this move is you just look at how the numbers shake out on this roster right now when Carter was at corner, you had the same number of scholarship cornerbacks as you did safeties on the roster, and that's eight at both positions. But you usually have, what, three safeties when you include the nickel slash star out on the field at the same time, usually only two corners. So there's a little bit more of an opportunity with him going to a group that maybe it's, it's a very deep group and, and a lot of guys with a lot of playing experience that we expect a lot of great things out of, but... You also that that's a position guys can get, get banged up, so there there might be more of an opportunity for Carter to get on the the field for more snaps at safety as well. And he, he's what listed at five eleven two hundred five, so he's got the size definitely to do that. As the bloodlines, like I said, that it makes a lot of sense for him to uh, to work there this spring. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I really like this move. I feel like when you look at his body, uh, he kind of fits that safety mold a little bit better. I think he's like well over 200 pounds now. And I think I think one of his best skill sets that we saw this past year in, in little spurts, we didn't see him a bunch, was, um, you know, his his open field tackling. I felt like him and Jaden Milner-Jones uh, did uh, did a good job as true freshmen. And 
I think that both of them uh, r- right now, I think, uh, have a very bright future uh, at the safety position. So I think Carter can uh, cover a little bit. We talked uh, a little bit about this on, on one of my shows recently with Robert Livingston. He's talked about wanting players that can kind of play positionless uh, football a little bit. And so I think when you got somebody like Carter Stoutmeyer on the field, I think he can play a little bit of that uh, hybrid safety role or, you know, you can throw him in the slot depending on what kind of look you're getting or you can throw him over at one of those traditional safety looks as well. But he's a guy along with Jaden Milner Jones that provide, I, I think, a lot of versatility at those positions. And so I'm I, I'm excited to see uh, how he transitions. But I, I think it's a move that makes sense. A lot of people here on YouTube uh, were, were, were calling this for, for a while. And so uh, I think that, you know, they were all really pleased to see that this was an official move. And I, I think it's going to serve the defense uh, re- really well. Um, but I, I wanted to talk with you about this as well, Adam. This is not necessarily a question, but it comes in through one of our channel members, uh, Tremaine Young. He says, We'll never stop the run unless we get a true middle linebacker. And this is something that I've, I've wanted to ask your thoughts on right now is how do you read this, this uh, inside linebacker group right now? Obviously we have Lejante Wester's brother, Jalen Wester coming over here. That's, that, that's going to play a linebacker, but uh, we got Levante Bentley returning Des Moines Kennedy. Uh, it's, it's been hard for me to get on a read with Trevor Woods where what his role is going to be if if he sticks around how do you view this this room coming together right now it's the the group that coach prime has mentioned hey we still we need to add bodies there and, and that's something they plan to do during the spring period and um they they had one briefly dj lundy that was exactly what yeah. they needed and uh going back to nil you know and it's it's tough when a booster base gets together and says we can't have our defense stolen from us so we're going to step up and you know so uh it would have been nice to see what he could have done in a colorado uniform because um that he was what was he i think he was the highest graded against the run by pro football focus among linebackers in all of college football last season funny he, stat. He, was, he was number two in the country number one in power five the one guy ahead of him was jalen wester interesting yeah, and yeah. he's a guy that Maybe we're sleeping on a little bit, and so we'll see if there's some buzz that that builds up there. And yeah, they've got some young guys there. We just until they, you know, step up and and it still feels like maybe a victory. Johnson, a Morgan Pearson, Kofi yeah. Taylor, Barracks might still be kind of another year away. But you really need that position to help you out on coverage units, and so those guys will have a role on this football team. And you know, you look at Brennan Gant and Des Moines Kennedy. These were two guys that. The staff had high hopes for, but I think they they realized it might not happen in year one. Gant came in with a knee injury, and that's why he ended up uh, not being able to play more than he he did last year. And um, it, it sounds like he's going to get a medical hardship to be able to play another year, which is crazy. Isn't this going to be like year number seven for him in college? <laughs> I, I had think? no idea. I didn't realize it's, it was it's at that least long. six. It's at least six. It might be seven. Uh, wow. But there were a couple flashes he showed out there, and he just wasn't healthy last year. Yep. Des Moines Kennedy coming back from the ACL when when speed is your game you can't you know he just wasn't going to play up to his potential I don't think that year that first year coming back from it so those are a couple guys that uh, they expect a lot out of now that they've gotten you know that time to get over their injuries. Do you think Trevor Woods is going to stick at linebacker? Is that kind of going to be his focus this off season, or do you think that uh, Rob Livingston is going to move him back to safety? It would surprise me to see him stay at linebacker. He just seems to play much more sound on the back end, and um, he's 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 a got a good frame, but I don't think you want him at linebacker for a whole season. I, I don't think that's that's the right plan. I think you got to go out in the portal, get a couple guys that uh, have a little more armor on their frame, like a DJ Lundy would have been, and get Trevor Woods back in at safety where he he's a pretty darn good playmaker back there. Mm -hmm. Agreed. One more question here from Darren Jennings. This is something that we talked a little bit about last month, Adam, but uh, he's asking, is the battle for center one of the most interesting position battles this spring? What say you? 
Yeah, I mean, it could be. I think if if Tyler Brown really took that by the horns and that was just a natural fit for him, he's probably one of their top five most talented offensive linemen. And you've got Justin Mayers um, and Tyler Johnson that are pretty established guards. And so that might be the mix that kind of gives you the, the best talent out there with your starting offensive line unit. But, yeah, you carry Walker started at UConn last year and is a guy that has – more experience at that position than obviously Tyler Brown does because he was a guard beforehand. And then Hank Solinskis, yeah, he's one of those wild card players that it wouldn't shock me if he was a, a starter for them, even though he's not a guy that a ton of people are talking about because, you know, new is always exciting. So you're talking about those right. new guys that they brought in as transfers. But yeah, those, I, I think those are the main three guys I'm looking at there. Is there anybody else you have as a candidate in there? No, that's kind of how I see it as well. Kind of like a three-horse race right now, I think. Yeah, I've kind of gone back and forth a little bit on if I think the starting center will be like Tyler Brown or Yakiri Walker. Uh, I, we'll have to see. I'm not the uh, the, the offensive line uh you know, genius uh, that that comes on the show. I'll, I'll I'll leave that to some of your other guests that can speak a little bit more. Uh, William Gardner uh, yeah. gladly <laughs> takes that. that gladly <laughs> takes that. So. Yeah, um, I do need to see what William thinks about this. I, I I need to tune in, but yeah, I'm I I think it's definitely something that I'm looking forward to just because i think our offensive line will be better because of all of this competition but this brings me to one of the other questions that i had for you adam we saw that i think brian howell had an article on this talking about the new contract details of a lot of the staff members or the 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 main assistants on staff great to see pat Shermer and robert livingston sign two-year deals a lot of the the new assistants are on two-year deals and guys returning are in the second year of their two-year deals. But one thing that really stuck out to a, a lot of us was the fact that uh, Coach Oldholt coming in signed a one-year contract, I think around the $325,000 range, if I remember correctly, uh, you know, offhand. What is your read on that contract right now? I thought that was uh, kind of interesting. Well, you – it matters for those individual people and their financial security. So I'm not downplaying it, but um, yeah. Colorado's fired so many guys that have multi- multiple years left on their contract, right? So it's not necessarily a security blanket the way maybe it sounds on paper. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there have been a couple assistant coaches at Colorado, even you know with the new state rules that went into effect, I, I want to say like 10 years ago, before 10 years ago, you couldn't give multi-year contracts right. to um, more than I think it was four people in the athletic department or something crazy like that. So it was a very select few. And ever since that changed, it, it is more normal than not for those guys to have multi-years when they first come on staff. But there have been some that have just had a one-year deal. And, and usually the case has been that they have, they're kind of stepping into a, a new role as a first time offensive line coach at this level. And Phil Lowenthal has gotten some good experience in his coaching career. And there's a reason Coach Prime brought him to Boulder um, and thinks that's the group because that's, I mean, that's the group that Coach Prime could not, you know, talk enough about needing to shore up last year. And so that's who he picked to run that group. Um, but he, he doesn't have, you know, that, that power four assistant coaching experience yet and um, maybe that had something to do with him in terms of not getting a multi-year deal I don't think it has anything to do with uh, lack of faith in him or lack of security it just you know sometimes your leverage in those negotiation situations with your agent is you you don't have quite as much when when it's a new gig you're stepping into without having that experience at the in in the past yeah yeah I think when you look at this as an opportunity for uh, coach Holhold, I think definitely uh, this this one year deal could be a, a big advantage for him because if we see a big jump in production from the offensive line this year, I, I think he could be in the talks for a significant uh, raise uh, w- with a new contract. No doubt. I think when I was looking at some of the offensive line coaches that are regarded as the, some of the best in college football, they're up there. Uh, around a million dollars or, or a little over a million dollars a year. Uh, and again, we'll have to see if, if we can get the assistant pool to start 
getting in that range here in the future to pay some of these assistants to continue to increase our uh, pay for coordinators, all of that. But I think, uh, you know, regardless of how that pool looks, I think if uh, if Coach Lodholt kills it this year, uh, he's going to be making a lot more than the than the three hundred. 25 or so uh, K that he's making this year. And so I, 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 I see this as a great opportunity uh, for, for him, no doubt. Um, Adam, I think that covers about all the questions that I had. Uh, okay, had cool. Highlighted. Um, is there, is there anything else on your end? Any other questions that you wanted to hit on? Um, uh, uh, otherwise, I feel like we can uh, start wrapping up. Well, I, I know you've got a, you've got a, uh, barbershop appointment to get to. So I'm not going to hold you from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta, I gotta get this thing cut, man. It is, it is so bad. I haven't had a cut since December. So uh, looking forward to that. Maybe get a little beard trim in as well, but uh, always. But no, it, it's good. It's good to leave a little meat on the bone, right? I mean, we got, we have a lot of months to, to, to talk about this program and spring ball will help because you have some fresh storylines and then you get the spring transfer window. There'll be new stuff to talk about, but only always holding back a little bit in February when it comes to CU football discussion is, is not, not a bad idea. Hey, that's right. That's right. But uh, before we wrap up, Adam, uh, please let the viewers know what do you got coming up? Uh, you know, soon that everybody can be looking forward to, as well as if they're not already in the know, no, you know, letting them know about your collaboration with Chico. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, first off, buffstampede.com is kind of my home base in terms of churning out content, covering the program. And then it's been a lot of fun you know, collaborating with a lot of different folks. David, obviously we've done a, a couple of collaborations now and Big Dog Chico and I uh, do a show about every week to a week and a half and it's called Buffum Updates. And we kind of run through some of the latest headlines and um, it's been great, uh, you know, getting his insights into everything. And so, yeah, it's been fun. You know, I had a chance to collaborate with Uncle Neely the other day. And uh, Colin Moore from Life Football is always great to, to connect with. And so, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of really talented folks that are um, covering Colorado. And, and we didn't have this before. YouTube was pretty quiet when it came to Colorado coverage until Coach Prime came in Boulder. So it's been cool to see, you know, different faces and, and voices emerge as as people that, uh, you know, break down everything CU football. Absolutely. And yeah, you're a big part of this, Adam. So it means a lot to, to have you collaborating with not only myself, but like you said, a lot of other people in this community now with, with how much it's growing. So uh, thank you again for taking the time uh, to, to do this mailbag with me. We'll connect again next month. And uh, to all the viewers, please be sure to subscribe to everything Buff Stampede. Uh, please hit that like and comment on the way out. That's greatly appreciated. Uh, we'll be back again soon. And as always, everybody, Sco Buffs.